Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Linda Lurie Nature Foundation Bio Blitz for Nantucket launch. So I'm really happy to be here this evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Sarah Boyce. I am the Director of Research and Education at the Linda Lurie Nature Foundation. And um, I'm going to be talking to you about the LLNF Bio Blitz for 2021 uh, using iNaturalist. And this uh, presentation is part of the Mariah Mitchell Association Science Festival. So we're really excited to again um, be participating in Science Fest with MMA and the Nantucket Community School. Um, and before we get started in the presentation, I just want to acknowledge both the Science Festival and all the sponsors and organizations that are participating. So if you're watching this um, during the week of Science Fest, we hope that you also um, attend some of the other events and learn about the natural world and science all around you. So thank you to MMA for including us again this year and um, I hope you guys have a fun science fest. So uh, today we're gonna be talking about the our bio blitz. So we're gonna um, first talk about what a bio blitz is. We're gonna talk about what happened in 2020. We did our 2020 was our first bio blitz. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about iNaturalist, which is the tool that we use um, to collect biodiversity information for our BioBlitz. Um, and then we're going to talk about our goals for 2021 and how we can um, build on and, and improve upon what we did in 2020. Um, and we'll go over how to get started. So we're going to go over how to so that it's um, a very easy thing for everyone to do. And we'll show you some additional resources too. So um, that's just what we're going to be covering for right now. So first of all, what is the BioBlitz? So um, generally, a BioBlitz is a very intensive survey out of a defined area. It's usually over a short period of time. So in our case, we're doing it for a month, but usually it's a weekend or a week. Um, and it's an inventory of every living thing. So it's really to get what the biodiversity is of a landscape. Um, and typically, BioBlitzes uh, bio involve scientists, community members, school groups, general public, families, it's a way to get people out in the community discovering the natural world around them. Um, this photo is from the Delaware Nature Society and I like it because it reminds me of when we used to be able to all come together um, and learn together as we collect things and, and explore the nature um, around us. So um, that was the spirit in which we started our BioBlitz, um, but we had to make some adjustments and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So in 2020, when we first um, remember, you know, remember back to a year ago when we first started our stay at home orders because of COVID, we were trying to come up with what can we be doing um, to continue to learn about the world around us. So it was uh, about bringing science and nature um, to our community. Uh, and so all these pictures are of my family on that on the right hand side. We took walk after walk every day because right that's what we were only allowed to do was walk with the people that we were already quarantining with. And so um, we started the LLNF BioBlitz as a way for people to help learn about the biodiversity around you. Um, people were getting out into exploring new areas that maybe they hadn't been to before, new conservation lands. And, and so it was a way for people to start collecting data. It's really great to have that data information about the biodiversity, but also learning about what's, what's around us. And also the timing. So right with spring happening, or starting in early March um, and moving into May, as we did in 2020, um, we could see the change, what we call phenology. So as things leaf out, as things bloom, as snakes and turtles emerge from winter. So it's a way that we could stay, um, you know, connected to the natural world around us while we were all sort of physically separate. And the main tool that we use for this is iNaturalist. So as I mentioned in the beginning with typical bio blitzes, people get together and obviously weren't able to do that. And so we were using iNaturalist because it's a way for people to connect online um, that are interested in nature and biodiversity. And so just a bit about iNaturalist, it's currently housed um, at both the California Academy of Sciences and through National Geographic. And what I sort of love about iNaturalist, not sort of, I really do love about iNaturalist is this originally it was a project created by a, um, a graduate student who was looking for a way to collect biodiversity information for uh, his graduate research. And it's turned into this amazing uh, free global biodiversity um, program. So this is the landing page on, the, on a, um, a desktop computer uh, or a laptop 
um, for signing up. It's free to sign up. So I'm just putting out this out there for, for those who want to join us to sign up for iNaturalist. And this is just um, as a whole, it is truly a global database. So there's this is just from a few days ago. There are over 59 million observations around the world. Uh, 322,000 plus species have been um, posted to iNaturalist. Um, there are over a million and a half observers, so people who have collected the data, and then um, 179,000 identifiers. So those are the people that identify the, um, the uh, individual sightings, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But just on this global map, the darker the red is like the more um, species, and you can drill down in this map and see what, what people are seeing around the globe. But just to give you an idea of how big this is and how many people are involved, um, it's really astounding and it's a truly an amazing data set for people to work with. So iNaturalist is a great tool because it's very easy. Anyone can use it. It is um, at its most basic. The first thing you do is you record an observation. Now in this infographic, it's a phone taking a picture of a caterpillar, but you could use a tablet, a phone, any kind of phone. You could use a camera um, and upload photos later. So it's any way you take an image of something and then you share it with fellow naturalists so that in this way you upload it to iNaturalist. So you share that photo. And then um, when it says discuss your finding, it's really um, people who are experts in the field will help identify um, what you've seen or confirm what you say your identification is. And then, um, and then the, the sighting lives on as a, as a data point. It's really that easy. And as I said, it works on all devices. So you can download apps on um, through the Android app or through however you get your apps like the App Store. Um, you can also, as I said, um, because it you can do it on a laptop or a desktop, if you take photos with it, you know, maybe you have a really great lens um, for taking bird photos or a macro lens for insects, you can upload those later as well on, on the desktop. So it's really easy with whatever devices you're comfortable with. And here's just a very simple way. I'm just gonna show you of how it's done. So you take a photograph of something living. In this case, we were taking a walk, we saw something green, it was early spring, and this was a, a honeysuckle just leafing out. This is my son, Charlie, this is when he was 10, and he took my old phone and took a picture of it and was uploading it to iNaturalist. And then we didn't know at that point which honeysuckle it was, just that it was a shrub honeysuckle. So we put Lanicera. And then um, that spot is geo-referenced based on where we took the photo. And then it gets put right into iNaturalist. We'll go into more details in a minute of how to exactly do this. All right, so in 2020, we set out some different um, BioBlitz goals. So the goals were pretty simple. How many species are here during March? Uh, which species are the most common? So what are we gonna see more of? Are there any invasive or exotic species? What stages of life are represented? So are we gonna see more eggs of something? Are we gonna see flowers? Um, you know, you can, you, um, that kind of information is really useful in a BioBlitz. And then which species are most surprising or intriguing? Are we gonna get some like very interesting observations? Of course, some of it is the time of year. So what are you gonna see in different times of year? And also uh, where people are going, right? Are they going you know, to um, uncharted areas of the island, if there are any? Are they going to certain conservation lands or just your neighborhood? Um, there's lots of different things possible. So, um, and this is um, basically, it's how it worked in 2020, but it's also how it's gonna work for 2021. So on any smartphone, um, you download the iNaturalist app, and set up an account. It's totally free, as I've already mentioned. Then you take a walk and any conservation area, any publicly accessible place, the beach, you can go to your backyard, um, and you take photos of what you see and submit them. So as I showed you, it's really, it's really pretty easy. So I'm gonna walk through an example now that's kind of a more specific example. So let's say I'm taking a walk, maybe it's um, Squam Farm, or maybe it's over by, um, my comet pond and I see this little painted turtle that is, it's springtime, it's sunny, it's coming out. And so I said, that would be perfect for iNaturalist. 
And so um, I pull up my phone and I do have an iPhone. So these examples are gonna be for um, an iPhone, but it's really similar for um, an Android phone. So I pull up my uh, phone. I, the circle at the bottom, you can see there's a camera, a picture of a camera that says observe. So you click that and it goes to a camera. And I took a picture of the turtle and you can either like that and say next, or you can retake it and you can see next. So the one thing I do wanna point out is up here, there's a plus, you can take more photos. So maybe you have, um, you wanna take a picture of the other side of the turtle or the habitat it's in, you can add additional photos, but that first photo you take will be the, the main um, default photo. Okay, so then you click, what did you see? And this is my favorite aspect of iNaturalist because it helps you identify things in the field. So sometimes I'm in the field, I'm taking a walk and I see a caterpillar and I don't know what it is. And um, I can take a picture and, and it can get identified later, but the algorithms within iNaturalist already might suggest something for you. So I can hit, what did you see? And based on the picture that you submit, it will guess what it is, um, or you know, it's an educated guess, I guess. Um, and so it knows that it's a painted turtle. Um, if you click that little I next to the painted turtle, um, it will give you species information. So just in the field, like with your phone, you can learn all about what you're looking at. You don't have to wait till later to come to go home. Um, and so when you, you can find out all the information about the painted turtle, you can see more pictures, you can see a distribution map. I mean, there's a lot of information just at your fingertips. Okay, but if I select painted turtle um, and I hit share, then you notice also there's already the date and the time the exact location, the latitude and longitude of where I was. Um, and then, <clears throat> so that's the great thing about using your phone is you, we all have a GPS in our phone that's gonna allow us to collect this level of data. So when I click share, it automatically, you can see it's syncing, it um, loads that um, right into iNaturalist. Now this next little piece is kind of what happens after. So um, this is, you know, days later. Um, and I had suggested painted turtle, that's the first one up here. Then um, this person, John G. Salamander, um, is his iNaturalist name, um, also said that the data was, or that the picture was painted turtle. Um, and then a third person actually went so far as to say it's an Eastern painted turtle, which is true. So with all of this agreement, this expert agreement, then the um, species or the observation becomes research grade. So that's kind of the, the the awesome power of this whole group of naturalists through iNaturalist. So this is a picture of my observation if you look at it on a, a computer, a desktop or a laptop. So what we're seeing is that um, it says research grade up at the top, which means there's been enough confirmation of this ID that this, is, this record is like a closer to true record, it's research grade. Um, it has a map on the, um, the map on the right shows this blue dot is where my observation was, that, that individual turtle. And the red in this case are other observations of painted turtles around my location. So in this case, Nantucket. So it's kind of great, whatever you see, you can say, Am I, is this the only one that's been recorded in iNaturalist? Or is this, um, you know, how many other species or how many other individuals have been seen? So we know that there's more than like 10 painted turtles on island, but what we can see from these data are that there's a big distribution of painted turtles um, on Nantucket. They're on the East Coast, they're on the West Coast, they're on the South Coast. So um, it's a great, great way to learn more about what we're seeing around us as well. So how does this play into the BioBlitz? So during the period of the BioBlitz, which was from March to May of 2020 originally, um, any observation um, on Nantucket got automatically put into the BioBlitz um, database. So that turtle observation um, is counted then for the BioBlitz. So we'll go into the BioBlitz a little bit more in just a sec. So the 2020 BioBlitz, it was our first time doing it. We thought it was only gonna be for a few weeks during stay at home orders. And then we all stayed at home <laughs> forever. So um, as you can see the date on here, uh, March 15th to May 17th, that was the, you know, we, um, the, the heart of the BioBlitz. So it's less of a blitz and more of a, of a slow walk, I guess. But for 2020, um, you can still see the BioBlitz page on iNaturalist. So you can still see this, the summary statistics. Um, and it always has at the top the most recent observations. So we'll go over some of this in a minute. 
But what I will say quickly about the most recent observations, it's really interesting because um, the person, I know who this, who this is, but the person who posted these used um, a camera. So you can see there's really beautiful pictures of this Baltimore Oriole, the Bluets, um, this oyster catcher, uploaded them later. So the person uploaded them in October. So even though it's well outside the BioBlitz window, because the photos were taken in May during the survey period, they were included in the BioBlitz, even though they were entered um, in October. So that's pretty, pretty cool um, to continually get additional data. And the BioBlitz, um, because it, we, you know, a BioBlitz needs to be defined by the specific area, we defined our area um, for the whole of the island. And this is for Nantucket County. So it actually does include Tucker Knock and Muskeka Islands. Um, and so these, all these red data points are points that were collected during the survey, the BioBlitz period. So there's more iNaturalist data that has been collected in other years and other times, um, but uh, in this map, what we're seeing is all of the BioBlitz data. Um, you'll notice that there's a bunch of points out in the ocean, both on the north and south of Nantucket, and I'll talk about why that is, but just note that for now, there's a bunch of, of data points out in the middle of the ocean. And that this little scroll along the bottom are just some of the observation photos that people um, took throughout the BioBlitz period. So I'm gonna talk now about some of what we found during 2020, some of the summary statistics and what our sort of target goals are for 2021, like what do we wanna beat? Um, and so we had over 600, we had 665 observations. So this first circle on the left, um, everything in green is research grade, which means it's been, it's gone through that um, uh, series of identifications where um, the observations are put to research grade. So more than half are research grade at this point, and that will continue to be added. So over the course of the year, people continue to identify um, uh, observations. So that's really great. Um, what I find most interesting is this middle figure of the 252 species found, because it's not just the species, it's the different taxa. So um, you can see which groups are most popular. So because I'm a plant ecologist, I'm really excited that the green bar is the biggest, so that plants were the most observed. Um, and then the breakdown of like, arachnids, um, mollusks, and I think this is insects that got cut off. Um, there's birds, a very small band of mammals, which makes sense for Nantucket because we have so few mammals. Um, fungi make up a bigger portion than I would have expected. Um, so it's kind of neat to see um, what people were focused on. because it's not just what's here, right? It's what catches people's eye, what people are looking for. So um, birds and plants are expected to be kind of the biggest groups, and they were, and um, and so that's kind of that's kind of interesting. So let's um, we can look at some examples as well. So when we the other thing I love about BioBlitz is, is it's always about the um, the race for first. So it's the most observations, the most species, and the most observed species. So first we look at you know um, most observations. So who submitted the most? I, it's not really fair because I submitted the most, but it was my project that I um, was driving for. So I was trying to encourage more people to um, to collect data. But um, NNIU, who I don't know who that was, but um, had almost the most observations. So 78 observations during the BioBlitz period, but had fewer species overall than um, Seth, my coworker. So it's kind of interesting thinking about how that breaks down where you can have tons of observations, but um, not observe not as many species. So these are kind of some of your stats to beat, and we can have maybe leaderboards um, moving forward, which would be really fun. And you can see that throughout the throughout the BioBlitz, you can check on that if you're if anyone's interested. Um, the other thing is about the most observed species. So I'm gonna um, have the same data, but on the next slide, um, you can look at the top species for the BioBlitz 2020. And what I what I kind of love about this is the data confirms what we know, right? So the most observed species are also some of our most common species on Nantucket. American robin, right? Eastern cottontails, white-tailed deer, mallards. Everyone you know, can think of a spot to go find a, a mallard duck. Pitch pines. Um, and the other thing about the plants that we're seeing, especially the Eastern red cedar, the American holly, and the pines are all evergreens. And why I think that's significant is that this bioblitz starts during March at a time when things haven't greened up yet, right? So the um, the leaves and all the trees and shrubs haven't come out, like the small wildflowers haven't come out yet. 
so we start with um, the evergreen. And so that's why those are kind of highly observed. So this is just, just to give you a snapshot of some of the more common um, species seen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then here's just a gallery view. So like sometimes you can look um, at the gallery view as the BioBlitz is going and just gives you a taste of some of the observations that were made. I, I failed to mention that last year, we also had a number of um, school classrooms that participated um, at the junior high uh, where students um, were collecting um, biodiversity information. But I like this particular screenshot because what it shows is some of the diversity of what people can look for. So you can take a walk on the beach and go beachcombing and find scallops and razor clams and um, different types of seaweed that you never knew maybe how to distinguish. You can um, use iNaturalist to help you with that. Um, and then you can also see in the corner of a lot of these photos, the RG for research grade. Um, if you, <clears throat> excuse me, um, are more comfortable staying at home, um, having feeders and you, watching the birds um, come to your feeder, you can see the Baltimore Oriole and the rose-breasted rose grosbeak in the same picture. Um, you know, and those are really great biodiversity um, information bits. Um, I will use this point to say um, what we, we we're not as interested in um, and what um, iNaturalist shies away from are planted species. So you wouldn't want to go into your yard and maybe take a picture of the hydrangea because while it is growing, it's not part of the natural biodiversity. However, if your yard has a lot of kind of like wild landscape, like there's black cherry and there's um, maybe huckleberry and blueberry part of the native landscape, those would be things that um, we would encourage in your yard. Um, we have earthworms, um, wild strawberries. I love, you know, these are kind of the very common things, green crabs up here um, that people will find um, anywhere, almost anywhere. So I'm gonna go through a few examples that show um, what people found. And I think they'll um, give you an idea of kind of the breadth of things that um, we can find during our bio blitz. So um, we're going to start with like kind of a very common thing that everyone can go out and find pretty much right now. Uh, bearberry is one of our most common woody plants. It's low growing and it's evergreen. So it's great. Um, anyone could find it out in the middle moors, um, at Linda Loring, uh, Sanford Farm, like any of the common conservation areas will have um, bearberry, the low growing um, shrub. This one was collected during our bio blitz uh, by Posey and um, this was done in April and what she noticed were um, the flowers. So this is really good phenology information too, um, where because it's flowering, now we know that bearberry is flowering in April. Um, and then with this, you can see on the map where else um, bearberry has occurred. And this one has already been um, upgraded to research grade. All right, so here's another type of observation. So this is a white-tailed deer and it's research grade also, but this isn't an actual picture of the animal, is it? This is a shed. So this is actually one of my observations. I found this shed at the Linda Laurie Nature Foundation in April. You can see it's April 5th is when I found it. And um, I took a picture of where I found it. So I didn't like take it somewhere else and then take a picture because that would change the geographic location, right? So I, took, I saw it, I took a picture of it on the ground where I found it. And so this is an indicator that the deer was here. And so you can take things like this. Um, people can take um, footprints too and pictures of scat because it's evidence of that animal. So um, it doesn't have to be a picture of the animal itself. And so uh, this is, yeah, one of the types of white-tailed deer observations people can make. So earlier I mentioned beach combing. Um, this is dead man's fingers or codium, which is, um, a common kind of what people call seaweed that you'd see in the rack line along the coast. And so what the other thing you might notice from this observation is this little pink exclamation point at the top. And if you click on that, it will tell you that it's um, an, an introduced species. So it says specifically introduced to Nantucket mainland, <laughs> main island, um, and it arrived through anthropogenic means. So that means people trans have transported this. So it's a non-native species. We consider it an invasive species, but it's a non-native species. So anything with that pink exclamation point will tell you that it's a non-native species. Um, and then the other thing that's kind of cool about if you want to learn more about Codium, you can look at 
outside of the BioBlitz, you can look at Codium on iNaturalist and say, huh, it's a non-native species. Where else does it occur? And you can see that Codium is global. Um, I actually don't know where Codium um, originated. I didn't I actually look that up before the talk, but you can see that it occurs throughout the globe and the darker the red are the areas where it's more commonly found. So it's just another way to get some more information about what you're finding. Um, another thing is to find, so in this case, the insect, but we found the egg mass instead of the insect itself. So um, I found this um, mantis egg case. Um, there, you know, once the egg, mantis lays its egg case in like late fall, early winter, it's there all year. So they're kind of around. And so when I found this, I took a picture, it was March 25th. Um, and it's a Chinese mantis. And so you can see the red exclamation point again, indicating that's a non-native species. So we have two species of mantids on the island, neither one are native. Um, but this is the activity that happened. So I suggested Chinese mantis. And then um, several other people chimed in and said it was all agreed with me. So then um, it got bumped up to research grade. Um, and then when you look at the Chinese mantis page, here's the kind of other kind of statistics that I like about what you can find on iNaturalist. You can find out who the top observers are. So uh, Aki Li, I don't know, um, she is the top observer for the species. So wouldn't it be cool to like, I could beat, I could beat her. I can find more Chinese mantis around the island. Um, and then, <clears throat> um, Mantodia is the top identifier. So anytime I, um, honestly, anytime I submit a mantid species, uh, Mantodia will identify it. Of course, these people are not on Nantucket. These are global, this is part of the global part of iNaturalist. The other thing to know is you can look at history, life stage of all these, and like lots of pictures of the species, but I like the seasonality piece. And I think this is interesting because I found the egg case in March. And if you look at March, you can see it's a really low time of year for them to be submitted to iNaturalist. So this is seasonality of submissions. And that makes sense because in the egg case, they're harder to find. So from, from January to like mid-April, they're kind of hard to find because they're just egg cases. And you might find them sometimes. In June, it dips. And that's because in May is when those, um, those uh, mantids hatch. And when they hatch, they're so tiny, they're really hard to see and they kind of drop into the brush and you won't see them. So from June to July, you really won't see them. And now those mantids are growing, growing, growing all summer and their peak is September. And why is that? Because they're an insect that's five inches long. So if you see something five inches long, that's a mantid, you're probably gonna take a picture of it. <laughs> you might submit it to iNaturalist. Um, and so from like, you know, September and October when those mantids are huge is when they're seen a lot and they're submitted a lot to iNaturalist. And then they taper off as they die, as they uh, lay eggs and then the adults uh, die for that year. So it's kind of really interesting to think about the submission of seasonality also matches the seasonality and the life history of that um, animal. Um, another thing I want to point out were rare species. So I took this picture of Nantucket shadbush um, April 11th of last year. And um, it's this is not a great photo, but it's um, the Linda Lori Nature Foundation. And this is um, the shad bush that was just starting to uh, bud out. And I knew that it was shad bush. Um, and um, you can notice the VU up at the top. So that's not the um, invasive indicator. It's called, it's a vulnerability indicator. And so just to remind you what shad bush looks like when it's not a tiny budded <laughs> twig. Um, anyway, so the, for the vulnerability, it says, it has a concert, it's a vulnerable conservation status in NatureServe. So NatureServe is a, um, a monitors conservation status of all species. And so because it's vulnerable, you'll notice that on the map, the dot is in the middle of the ocean and it's a fuzzy box. So basically it, um, anything that is considered vulnerable is um, given a priority status where they won't give you exact location information. Um, so I know I can tell you that this was found at the Linda Lori Nature Foundation, but I think you don't have to worry if you're interested in taking pictures of uh, rare or endangered birds, insects, plants. I mean, we have to be careful that we are respectful of those individual species, like you don't trample the plants or um, harass the birds or move insects, but you can take a picture of it and be um, and, and submit it to iNaturalist 
and not be concerned about um, revealing location information. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show as an example was, uh, while this is a picture of a daffodil in my yard, I'm focused on the pollinator. So I mentioned before, you know, there have been a lot of daffodil submissions because people want to take pictures of things in their yard. Um, iNaturalist really prioritizes natural landscapes. So we, we love to do stuff in, the, in our yards, but really um, I want to uh, steer away from the things that people have planted, like daffodils, the hydrangeas, um, even um, anything like landscaped, right? But I took this picture because I was really interested in the pollinator, and I knew it was a bumblebee, but I couldn't have told you what kind of bumblebee it was. But from um, submitting it to iNaturalist, it was identified as a two-spotted bumblebee and has been upgraded to research grade, so that's pretty great. And um, it's a way because, um, you know, it's a way for me to understand more about the pollinators in my own yard and the insects in my own yard by taking um, pictures from my naturalist. It's something I'm learning more about myself. So um, with that, you know, I really want to encourage people to join us for our BioBlitz for 2021. So our plan is uh, the BioBlitz has started today, March 16th, um, and we are going to run it for one month. So we have less time than last year. So last year we ended up running it for two months just because we thought the pandemic would end. <laughs> um, and so we have one month to collect as many um, biodiversity observations as we can. And we want everyone possible to join us. It not only provides us with biodiversity information about the island, but it helps you learn about what you're seeing around you, both your yard, your favorite walking areas, um, and helps you maybe explore new properties and locations too that you hadn't thought about before. So how you join us is you just sign up for iNaturalist and start taking observations. You're, if you're collecting observations within the county of Nantucket, you're automatically um, put into the BioBlitz. You could officially become a member by just like tapping that screen and, and, and joining the project, but really you just have to uh, join iNaturalist and start taking information. Um, we're gonna be posting updates uh, throughout the month on our social media pages. Um, we have a page on our website at llnf.org where you can find out some more information um, about how, you know, uh, printed materials about how you can um, collect observations. If you do kind of see some cool things and share them on social media, we hope that you tag it as LLNF BioBlitz 2021. Um, and then we can kind of all see each other's um, observations. But the best way is to kind of stay connected through iNaturalist. So our goals, so I, you know, we have the goals of collecting as much biodiversity information as we can and learning about them together. But I mean, it's really fun to have like hard number goals. And so I really want to beat 2021. I mean, 2020. I mean, for so many reasons, 2020 was not the best year. So isn't it fun to try to beat it? So um, we want to collect more species than last time. We want to have more people collecting observation data. We had 665 observations. Wouldn't it be great to have 1,000 observations? Uh, we had 67 observers. I think we can get at least 100. Um, and we want to cover more of the island. So I pulled up this map again of all the observations from the BioBlitz last year. And there were some like really big holes that jumped out at me. And so the first one was CO2 and great point. And I was like, why did no one go there? And then I realized we weren't allowed to go there. So that area was closed at this time last year. And so this is a really good opportunity to kind of get out and add some biodiversity information from Great Point and Co2. Um, for some reason, Tom Nevers um, wasn't really serving, I mean, like the, the homes and like where people's houses are, but that area needs to be explored somewhere. That would be a fun project. Quidnet for some reason um, was, you know, kind of low. I don't know why, why around Sakashapan and Quidnet, um, there wasn't a lot of activity. Maybe walking those beaches would be fun. And then of course, Tuckernuck and Muskeget, which um, other people have collected uh, naturalist data for those outside of the biodiversity window, but there wasn't much action happening on Tuckernuck or Muskeget. So if anyone goes out there during the BioBlitz period, it'd be really fun to add um, those data to, to our, our survey this year. Um, so like I said, we're going to be posting about updates and like leaders of species and leaders of people potentially, but really I want to, um, you know, I want to beat out those robins too. Robins as the most observed um, animal, it would be really great to kind of uh, mix it up and see what else we can see out there. 
Um, and then there's a lots of additional resources. So as a, a wonderful citizen science program, iNaturalist has tons of short video tutorials on like how to um, observe with your mobile device, how to observe using the website. So if you do have a camera and you want to up upload um, observations later on the website, there's lots of great tutorials. They even have things like how, the, how to best take observations, how to, you know, really great info about photos and, and taking photos. And, um, and so there's a, a, a wealth of things to explore through that. There's also teacher's guides um, for additional educational materials, and I'm available as well to help with anything. So I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, don't go away yet because we're going to have a short video of me in the field demonstrating how easy it is. Um, but I just want to end with my contact information. I'm happy to help anyone get started um, and answer any questions that they're, they're uh, to be had as well. And, you know, we've been doing um, iNaturalist with um, our son for a number of years now. It's been really fun to um, have him collect BioBlitz information and, and help us um, catalog, in this case, the Eastern Tent Caterpillars and the Black Cherries. So thanks everybody for joining us this evening and I hope you have a wonderful science fest. Hi, so we're here at the Linda Laurie Nature Foundation and we're gonna go over how to use iNaturalist in the field. So let's say you're at Linda Loring and you're taking a walk and you see something, you either don't know what it is and it's kind of cool or you see something you might wanna log in iNaturalist. Um, it's really super easy to do. So here we have right here, um, we have a little earth star fungus um, I'm not going to move it right now because the first thing would be to take a picture of it in its habitat, right? And if it's a plant, we don't want to pick something. We don't know what it is. We don't want to move any animals. So um, I'm going to grab my phone uh, to pull up the iNaturalist app, okay? And then just on the home screen, which I know it's kind of hard to see, um, we're just going to click observe because it has a camera and it brings it right up to the camera. And now the best thing for taking photos in the field is just to try to get um, close to the object, but also to get some of the habitat. Um, I'm gonna use this photo. Um, and then the other thing that's great with iNaturalist is you can take multiple photos. So if it's something I did close up, I might wanna take another photo and take a bigger kind of back out a little bit to get the overall habitat. And um, that's helpful for identification. Okay, so then the only thing I have to do next is hit what did you see and it gives suggestions um, on my species which is really helpful in the field for helping identify things but also um, for when you submit. So right away it has our earth star fungus, it has the genus and species of things that have been seen nearby and that were visually similar. It has the date, the time, exactly the location of where we're at and so I can hit share and there you go right away. Um, that's how easy it is to submit something in iNaturalist. And now the um, now that it's submitted into iNaturalist, the um, identification can be verified and then it can contribute to the biodiversity information of the Linda Lurie Nature Foundation.